<coughs> Hello, everyone. I suppose we can start. Uh, I'm Svetlana Sakova. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains. And uh, today I'm going to talk about Kotlin coroutines. I can hardly see you, but <laughs> probably it will work. At least uh, uh, people on the first row are lucky and I can see you. And I will be able to see whether you're confused or not, because this topic is kind of a complicated one. Uh, but I hope to share the power that uh, this kind of old, new approach brings. Kotlin coroutines is a concept that is available al already. So not, sorry, not Kotlin, but coroutine uh, as a concept is available for a lot of decades. And um, uh, at first, it was used to model asynchronous programming even before threads were invented. And for instance, C sharp async await is a feature that works, that uses coroutines under the hood in the underlying implementation. But you, as a developer, you only use async and await functionality. There are coroutines and channels in Go that are quite popular. And in Kotlin, with some uh, differences, it's basically the same idea, the same concept. And there are many more languages and approaches that also are interested in adopting the same pattern. So after uh, hearing about Kotlin coroutines, you will not only learn about, hopefully not only learn about Kotlin coroutines, but about coroutines in general, and that is one of my goals. Who is here C Sharp developers? OK, so my guess was correct, because I kind of assumed that I will do a talk for people who already know what is a sync await. Because in the Java world, uh, there is no similar concept, and uh, we need to start from scratch and uh, explain how it works. I will uh, briefly explain, but I want to go uh, deep into detail here. In Kotlin, you can use the same async and await as in C Sharp. OK, it looks a bit differently. In C Sharp, you uh, use async and await, and async and await are language keywords. In Kotlin, async and await are regular functions. So it looks a bit differently. You can specify a uh, type for process image function, and it will return you the deferred object, which is similar to task. So we have another name for task in Kotlin, deferred. But the concept is, is the same. It's very similar. Interesting thing here is that async and await in C Sharp are language keywords. In Kotlin, they are just functions defined in the standard library and the ability to define them as functions, as many more functions that uh, library or <laughs> regular that will uh, be having in this way, is based on the, co on the concept of coroutines. And together, uh, today, we are going to discuss how exactly it works and what are coroutines. My agenda for today's talk is, at first, I want to discuss suspend functions. So that is something new that Kotlin brings uh, to the picture. Uh, that is, uh, you, you will write uh, the code in a bit different manner in Kotlin rather than just using a uh, in C Sharp. Then I want to cover what, I want to explain what is a coroutine. Then we are going to discuss structural concurrency. That is another important thing that uh, comes to the world with Kotlin coroutine support. And I want to add uh, talking about channels. So let's start. And let's first discuss the suspend functions, how to write code uh, with a suspend function. So in Kotlin, again, it's a bit differently. Let's start with example. Let's imagine we have simple consecutive logic. And uh, let's imagine that our login method needs to do some authentic authentication, does need to go to a service, so it might be time consuming. And uh, we would like to avoid here blocking the thread while calling this method. Let's imagine that load uh, goes to, I don't know, remote database. That's another uh, probably blocking method that might block the thread that is time consuming. And both th these methods will just await the result for most of the time. And uh, just writing this code straightforwardly in a uh, consequent fashion 
is not good because we are blocking the threat. We use, uh, we waste resources. This threat just waits for most of the time. We would like to avoid it. And if it's main UI threat, it's even worse because our user is blocked. This is the general story that you probably uh, listen when you are uh, l listening to a talk about a sync await in C sharp. And indeed, C sharp with a sync await brings the solution to this and say, okay, now you. Uh, extract your function that goes to service into uh, something returning a task. In Kotlin uh, case, it will be deferred. And then you uh, start, uh, this function will start our, uh, this request asynchronously. And then you will, you will need to call await, to use await to await for this result. This solution do doesn't block underlying thread. Uh, it is fine, nice, and everything works great. In Kotlin, again, you can use the similar uh, approach. You can write the code in very similar fashion. Task is replaced with deferred. Uh, you call a sync. Uh, you call um, a sync as a function, and await is also as a uh, function available on this deferred object. Uh, it's not a language construct. However, in Kotlin, you can also do better than this, and uh, instead of defining a function that returns a future, a deferred, or uh, corresponding to a task in C-sharp, you can mark this function with a suspend modifier, say, meaning that this function can somehow suspend under the hood. This, uh, this function can pro will, pro will most probably wait for something, and uh, it might be suspended while running this code. This works very similar to how a sync await work, because uh, this uh, in a sync await case, await also marks uh, the point when uh, the uh, computation might be suspended. So suspend function is a function that can be suspended. In the case of C sharp, we have explicitly suspension points marked with a wait. If you think about it, that uh, the same idea, you uh, use a wait somewhere when your function, in this case, show user info function, might be um, suspended, waiting until the result is ready. And in Kotlin, it works in the same way, with the only difference that now any function, any suspend function call is a marker of of this function that can be suspended. Not only a wait, a sync and a wait can be used in this way, but any function can be marked as suspended. And as a result, you no longer need to put a wait to all the places where, you're, uh, where in your code you need to await for the result, where, where uh, there is some suspension point. The code, now the resulting code in Kotlin case, looks just the same as uh, the one before, the one on the first slide, when we had, uh, when we wrote everything in a blocking manner, in a wrong blocking manner. IntelliJ highlights all the points where the function might be suspended. So here in this slide you see these um, broken arrows, and these arrows uh, are markers in IDE, showing that here you call suspend function, here, your computation might be suspended, mi might be uh, broken. There is a question. Where it's possible to call a suspend function? So in Kotlin, anyone can define a suspend function. And uh, the question is, OK, where can we call them? And if you try to, uh, to call it from a regular function, like just write function test, and call our suspend function from this test, then you'll see the compiler error that suspend function show user should be called only from a coroutine or another suspend function. And uh, that brings us to the, concepts, to the concept of coroutines, saying that this uh, suspend function can be called only inside a coroutine or another suspend function. And now I'm going to uh, move to the concept of coroutines. Before we move on, I want to probably uh, 
highlight a bit more why we ha we uh, decided why in Kotlin it was uh, decided in this way so that uh, use any suspend function as a marker instead of using classical async await approach. In at first, in C Sharp, you need to put these await markers all the time. But more importantly, in uh, C Sharp, when you call, uh, when you just call a function that uh, calls uh, that starts some computation asynchronously without uh, calling a wait, then you will start the computation in a. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I will just. Yes, this. Uh, <coughs> uh, you will just uh, remember that I have, have a slide for this. Uh, so why not? Uh, why not? Why Kotlin doesn't use a wait keyword similar to what we have in C sharp? In C sharp, if you start, if you just write uh, the function that throws, uh, that starts asynchronous computation concurrently, by default, uh, that uh, th th that will be like concurrent version. And to make it sequential, you will need to explicitly call a wait on this function. And Kotlin kind of changes this default. Now, if you just call the suspend function, that just means, OK, this function somehow can be suspended under the hood. And uh, to make it concurrent to start your uh, your computation concurrently, you will need to use explicit syntax for this. So the idea is to, to modify this default uh, choice of how to write the code and to make all the concurrency explicit while, uh, there, uh, w while at the same time making this mechanism of suspension in, uh, built in in the language while using the suspend functions. <coughs> Any questions? So far, you can ask questions during the talk. Yes. Yeah. How to? How to? How to? It uh, it's possible to 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 start uh, uh, tasks concurrently. Multiple yes, multiple questions time. Uh, let's. Let's move on then, and I will show this example. So yes, that's possible. So now uh, we are going to talk about coroutines. What is the concept of coroutine, and um, how uh, and how basically to start several computations asynchronously concurrently the same way? The short answer is very similar to to what you used to, and uh, that's possible. So what is a coroutine? Coroutine is a computation that can be suspended. What does it mean? We start a computation in a thread, a coroutine, and then at some point, uh, when it needs to wait for network result, when it uh, needs to wait for some uh, for, for uh, some result of its request, it can be suspended. That means that we can put it off the thread, uh, store it in memory, and then restore it. There, uh, this uh, I think await in C sharp works in the same way under the hood because the it's also implemented via coroutines, so that's a very, very generic way to explain how all coroutines work. And while uh, our coroutine is suspended, so this computation that waits for our network result, the thread is free to be occupied with other tasks and activities, so we can start some other computations here uh, while our coroutine is waiting for the result, and when the result is uh, coming, then this coroutine can be restored to the main thread. How to create a coroutine and how to start, uh, for instance, uh, this asynchronous computation? We already know that because we see this async board. Async is one of so-called coroutine builders. They are just library functions. Again, async is one of the library functions, but there are more. So for instance, there is another one, launch, uh, mentioned in the previous talk, I will, for simplicity, I will just use a sync in this talk. Uh, so there are different library functions that can start computations in a different manner. A sync starts a new computation synchronously. You can use run blocking, which is a common entry point. Uh, in this way, it starts uh, a new computation either in a blocking uh, manner. It often is used in main functions and tests. 
but when you write code, you most uh, commonly will use async and other library functions. Interestingly here is that different libraries can define their own coroutine builders. So because coroutine builders is just a pattern that should be followed when you write code in Kotlin, it's possible to define coroutine builders that are specific to the library, to some use case, to some specific case in the library. Let's uh, look at how very simple or load classical load image exam example works. This one uses a sync await, and uh, again, I would say that it's very similar to how it works in C sharp. And then we'll uh, we'll see how it uh, how it works with general suspend function. But it explains this mechanism mechanism of suspension accordingly. So in this example, we have load image async function that calls async, which starts a new asynchronous computation. Async creates a new coroutine, and uh, because I think async is defined in this way, it starts new computation asynchronously. I will mark that, okay, we probably will start it on a different thread, and I will uh, uh, mark this uh, load image async um, coroutine uh, with this uh, green color. Then we call process image. In inside process image, w w uh, first load images, load image I think is called, and uh, then uh, await is called. Await is a suspension point, and await function is just defined as a suspend function in Kotlin library. So that what I was talking uh, about to you that await and async are just library functions in Kotlin. They are not keywords. And uh, the power is that similar concepts, similar constructs, similar library functions might be defined and added to libraries. Await is defined as a suspend function, and that means that await is uh, that await actually can suspend the coroutine. In this case, we already started our load image async on new thread. Now, when the code continues its execution, here I just extracted the result of load image async to a variable in order to better understand what's going on. We store the reference to this computation in a deferred variable. In case of C sharp, it's stored just in a task variable. And then when we call await, it is the marker that says this. At this point, the computation should average for something, and unless the result is already available, the main computation must be suspended. So if our image was cached and the result was returned immediately, then await is not, uh, doesn't need to suspend the computation, it just can continue its execution. In our case, the image is loading, so await suspends the process image computation that uh, meanwhile awaits for the result. So here, now, process image computation is suspended, and the first thread is free to be occupied with other tasks and activities. When load image loads the image and returns the result, then this process image coroutine can be returned to the thread, can be so-called uh, resumed, and can continue its execution. So that's how general mechanism of suspending the coroutine works. Again, this picture also describes how it works in C sharp. In Kotlin case, because every suspend function might be the point where the coroutine is suspended, the coroutine can be suspended, for instance, several times. So in case of show user, we have this our show user function, and it does two rec network requests that potentially might be uh, might await for the result, and if they implement it in the correct fashion, if they use the suspension mechanism, then they mean that mean that this coroutine can be suspended twice. The first time when we call login, and it waits for some result. Second time when we call load, and again it waits for the result. When I talk, when I'm talking that here in this example coroutine will be suspended twice, you can ask which coroutine. Which coroutine gets suspended when a suspend function is called? And the answer is very similar. The one, simple, the one that just contains this suspend function. In our 
application, we need to call show user from, I've told you, either suspend function or, another, or a coroutine. Let's say we call this show user from some coroutine, started with async, and uh, when I'm telling you that show user that this coroutine will be suspended when show user waits for, uh, for something, that means that this coroutine created by async, the parent coroutine, the auto coroutine, will be suspended. You can define suspend functions that call uh, different suspend functions. So you just need to mark this, uh, all these functions as suspend. So in Kotlin, there are like two worlds, regular functions and suspend functions. And suspend functions mean that they are special functions that uh, should be called in on the signed coroutines, and they mark uh, that, uh, in this case, the coroutine can be suspended. And uh, the call stack of your suspend functions might be deep in, like uh, as deep as you need. So for instance, here we first start coroutine with calling async. Then we call show user. Show user inside uh, this function calls another uh, suspend functions like load user. Then at some point it needs to call either wait or another library function that in its turn uses the language primitive that actually says that, okay, this is the point when coroutine is suspended. So at the language level, we have suspend coroutine function that will actually suspend a coroutine. But as an application developer, you will, you can def uh, you will probably never use it. You use uh, library functions like await and other different uh, libraries. For instance, you, you can use library that allows you to perform network requests in a suspend function and so on, or to connect to databases in a suspend function f fashion and so on. You use suspend coroutine if you're a library author or you want to add to write a wrapper to your library. In this case, you can write this wrapper to, because if you have a library that doesn't uh, support suspend, this is, this supports only futures or, um, or callbacks. In this case, you can write wrappers. Uh, and to write the wrappers, you will use a special template and use suspend coroutines. But in general case, you only, you are living in this application level as an application developer, and you can define your own suspend functions which call another suspend functions, which under the hood will call await or other library functions. And that turns out to be really convenient because now you can, you, you don't need to put all the awaits everywhere, uh, but you can just uh, t keep in mind that, okay, this is the function that might be suspended this at some point, and you can structure your code accordingly, which results in a, in a really better structure in the end. When the coroutine is suspended, the whole uh, object of coroutine is stored on the heap. So uh, in this case, we have this uh, call stack, and uh, uh, it represents the coroutine. The coroutine is stored using only one object, and uh, when the coroutine is suspe suspended, this object is just stored in memory, and it saves the call stack together with all the captured variables along the way. So the coroutine stores all the information uh, to be able to resume it. That's how it works under the hood. And when you res uh, resume coroutine, the call stack is restored and the coroutine continues its execution. You can ask here, on which thread does the coroutine start and resume? And uh, the answer is that you specify that when you create a coroutine. So you can use some default parameters, but you can provide explicit parameters. For instance, you, you can decide that I want to run this coroutine on a thread pool, or you can uh, decide I want to run this coroutine on the main UI thread, and you just specify it explicitly in your application, or you can use some default parameter for, for, coroutines in a for all the coroutines in, in the given scope. Here I say run your or resumed coroutine on a thread. However, more uh, <laughs> correct would be uh, would be say schedule your resumed coroutine on a given thread, because obviously if you 
resume your computation and it should run on the main UI thread. If this main UI thread is busy, and this, uh, this time this routine will be just scheduled, not run immediately, and it will be run when the thread gets free. The same with the uh, thread pool. If all the threads in the thread pool are busy, then it should wait a bit more until something is, uh, is free. And <laughs> there are other dispatcher, there are other dispatchers that, for instance, can add more threads dynamically if, uh, if everything else, uh, if every everyone is occupied. But uh, here, interesting thing also is that you can define your own dispatchers. You can create your own way, um, specifying how to uh, how to schedule, how to run these routines. But uh, for majority of the cases, the default ones are available and work quite well. Coroutines can be nested inside one another, so it's very easy to start a, a coroutine inside another coroutine. And you can ask here, is there any relationship between parent and child coroutine? And the, the answer is yes. And uh, it turns out us to talk about structured concurrency. W everything that I've told uh, before, especially of how the suspension mechanism works. This is known for decades right now, and this is already implemented in many languages. In Kotlin, new approach is using the suspend function, but uh, some may argue that uh, it mostly syntactic thing, however, really convenient. This uh, structural concurrency is something new. It's also can be applied not and can be implemented not only in Kotlin. There are some libraries that try to implement it, for instance, for Python. But in Kotlin, it uh, is something that is built in. And uh, interestingly, at first, Kotlin didn't have structural concurrency. So we have uh, the coroutines uh, for some time was were available in experimental state for quite a long time, for several months or even a year. And during this time, it uh, was found out that just uh, Keeping the structure, the relationship between different coroutines by hand is quite complicated and it can be done automatically by the compiler. So let's discuss uh, what structured structural concurrency is and how it works. Let's start with an example. Let's say we have two asynchronous coroutines. So you can easily start uh, computations asynchronously. For this, you still use async await. So uh, suspend fu suspend functions real are really great when you ha when you don't have uh, concurrency. You just want something to be done asynchronously and wait for the result. For concurrent cases, async await just work great. In this case, we have the overlay function that probably is CPU consuming. We is just uh, we'll do some algorithmic logic of overlaying two images. And uh, we have this suspend launch and overlay function that, at that tries to start to load two images concurrently. And uh, at the end, it will just pass this loaded images to overlay function. It just works great. Lot of overlay will be suspended until the result is, re uh, is ready. So uh, that is a okay example, especially if everything works well. However, what happens if the exception is thrown inside one of the child coroutines during an image load? The problem with this approach, unless you do something special, is that the second coroutine will leak. It will just continue to load the image. No one will cancel it. Again, we have uh, the green coroutine that fails. Then, exception, let's imagine exception is thrown. A wait will just rethrow this exception further, and uh, the load and overlay coroutine will catch this exception. It, do it doesn't handle it in any way, so it will just rethrow it, and it will fail as well. However, in this case, no one does anything specifically with a second started coroutine, and it just continues its execution. Uh, it uh, and. Uh, no one is interested in this result, but it continues to load the image. And this is a problem. This problem might be uh, somehow addressed by the framework or, appli uh, or application developer. You can manually store the references to all the started activities, uh, keep this 
uh, references and do something accordingly when something goes wrong. Kotlin now provides the built-in solution to this problem. By introducing local scope, you just fix this problem. When the parent, uh, when the child routine leaks or fails, sorry, then the parent scope catches this exception and automatically cancels all the child routines and then fails itself. So we have the same as before with this difference that now we don't have the problem, the second routine is cancelled. Coroutine scopes are built in, in this coroutine framework, coroutine library, and coroutine scope waits for completion of all children coroutines, and uh, also it cancels all child coroutines if something went wrong. And that uh, this functionality is built in, in the language support, and it's not only built in, it's enforced. So in uh, my, some of my examples, I didn't use the syntax to simplify things. However, in Kotlin, in real Kotlin, you can't start new computation anywhere. You need to always provide a scope in which scope you start new coroutine. A sync function under the hood is defined as an extension function on coroutine scope, so you just won't resolve if you just try to call a sync everywhere. You always need to start uh, coroutines inside a new scope. You can start it explicitly inside coroutine scope. You can start it in global scope. And um, this uh, global scope syntax is something that, so at first, in the first design, all the coroutines were started in the global scope. And at some point, it was clear that uh, it works better with this structural way, so all the coroutine builders were rewritten and uh, now they require explicit scope. Good news is that are that you don't need to always say scope dot async. In Kotlin, you can um, uh, you can start when you start a routine inside another uh, coroutine. So, for instance, here we have nested coroutine. The first one uh, calls. Um, uh, the first one is called on glo the global scope. Then inside we start a second one. And the second uh, child coroutine is started in the scope of the outer coroutine. And uh, uh, this scope of outer coroutine is present in the context implicitly by this reference. And you can omit this reference. And you, uh, you, your started coroutine just look like, so you, you, you just call a sync. So in Kotlin, it's indeed the case that you often call a sync without uh, the scope. However, the scope is implicitly present in the context anyway. So this structure, this structural approach in Kotlin is enforced and you just can't start coroutines everywhere. You can use the global scope uh, to start coroutines, but the recommended way to do it is to always use scope. If your application has uh, some objects with a life cycle, then you can uh, create a scope specific, uh, attached to this object, just inside this object, and start all the coroutines inside the scope, the, all the nested coroutines concerned to this object. And then when the object um, uh, uh, ends, then all the coroutines will be automatically cancelled. So that is quite convenient, that's recommended practice, but in general you, ju you, you, you can decide uh, which scopes you have and uh, uh, start new coroutines from the scope and everything then will be uh, covered automatically, nothing will leak. So this is something new, something probably that will be available in some frameworks and libraries and probably is av already available, but in Kotlin there is this built-in support for a structure between different coroutines that works via scopes, and this is called structured concurrency. Now we move forward, and um, the next question is, how to sh uh, how to share information between different coroutines? So we have like w we can have many coroutines and there's some uh, asynchronous programming under the hood, and we definitely need to somehow 
communicate with between them. And the answer is uh, this lozung share by communicating is kind of um, a prey in the Go world. They always say share by communicating. And because we have the same coroutines uh, in the language, then the answer to this will be very similar. Use channels. And this channel story is, again, it's not Kotlin invention. It's present in many languages. Now it's available in C Sharp as well. It uh, thrives especially in Go. And uh, I, want, I will just briefly cover how channels work with coroutines. Channels are used for, we can think of it as a synchronization, but uh, we uh, better say for communication between coroutines. Now, uh, the uh, instead of sharing mutable state, when we're talking about coroutines, we prefer to say that we, uh, they should share something by communicating with one another, with each other, not by having access to a mutable state. So that is a little bit of mind shift. You need to get accustomed to this concept. But again, it's something that just how the mortal world writes this code, including Go, now Kotlin, and probably some others as well. So now our synchronization primitives should be replaced with communication primitives, and channel is this com main communication primitive. Channel is a very simple thing. It is just an interface that provides a way to send to it and to receive to it, receive from it. And one coroutine can send to it, another can receive from it, and Basically, it, say it solves the classical cons producer consumer problem when you can have several producers, several coroutines that can send to the same channel, and several consumers, several coroutines that can receive from the, from the same channel. So uh, the, uh, it can be one producer, se many consumers, it can be many producers, one consumers, the, this, that all works uh, via this channel mechanism. The uh, channel have two views. Uh, so channel interface actually extends to different interface, send channel and receive channel. And uh, when you pass a reference to consumers, you pass the same channel as receive channel. And if you w when you pass a reference to producers, you will give them send channel. So it's straightforward. On the first glance, Channels looks very much like general queue, with one important difference. All, both these send and receive channels are defined as suspend. So for instance, in C-sharp, uh, the same channels are available, but you will need to work uh, with them via a sync await mechanism. So you will uh, await, you can await for the result of receive and send. In Kotlin, because we have sus suspend functions, both these send and receive functions can be defined as suspend functions in the library. There are many different types of channels. So for instance, there is an unbuffered channel you, that can store as many elements as you uh, want to send to it. However, in this case, you have uh, a possibility of uh, out of memory exception because no one controls how many elements or how many things you want to store in it. There, uh, there is uh, also the buffer channel that has limited capacity, and uh, when the capacity is achieved, all the s following send calls will suspend. There is uh, the rendezvous channel, which ha w that is a buffer without any capacity, so uh, without a buffer. There's a channel without a capacity, like buffer channel with capacity zero. So for rendezvous channel, the send uh, call will always suspend unless there is the receive call that is already uh, waiting to receive something. We are going to discuss how it works uh, in a, a minute uh, next. And there is also this conflated channel, which just uh, allows you to override the elements and receive the last element that was uh, 
uh, that was added to this channel. So it works for situations when you are interested only in the last event, but not in the whole history of the events. When we're talking about rendezvous channel, this is their most basic channel without any buffer. And both send and receive calls can suspend if there is uh, the, 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 there is no another call that is already awaiting for the result. We say that uh, each, uh, the element is transferred only when send and receive notifications meet in time, and this meeting in time is uh, gives this name of the channel, rendezvous channel. And now I want to demonstrate to show you how exactly this rendezvous channel works. What does this mean, this uh, send and receive calls meet in time in this channel. So let's say we have, again, classical consumer pr uh, producer consumer problem. We have, uh, in our case, we'll have one producer that sends tasks to a channel and a um, couple of consumers that are ready to receive and process these tasks accordingly. Each, uh, pr uh, uh, all producer and couple of consumers are different core teams. For simplicity, at first, let's say that the channel will send only two tasks. So here we create a channel of the uh, that stores the element of type task. And we start a coroutine, produce a coroutine, that will simply send a couple of tasks to this channel, and after that it will close the channel. Then, uh, in our simple scenario, we'll have two consumers. Each of them will just receive one, receive one element from this channel and later process the element. This process task function, it might be suspend function or it might be just CPU consuming function, doesn't matter. Uh, the uh, thing is, we need to call this receive, uh, receive call from channel from coroutine because it is a suspend function. So here we have two consumers that just, each of them just receives one task. How it works? We create a channel, then let's say in our case the, f uh, the first consumer starts first, so this coroutine that receives one element is started, and then it tries to receive an element from the channel. However, there is no send, the channel is empty, Nos nothing uh, was sent to it, and because of that this consumer coroutine gets suspended. So this receive call suspends this consumer coroutine. This coroutine gets suspended. And then let's imagine the consumer coroutine starts and uh, it is ready to send something to channel. It sends the first task to the channel. And now that moment of rendezvous happens, send call meets receive call, and the value is actually passed from uh, from producer to consumer, which awakes the producer coroutine that receives this task and start to process it. In the meantime, the producer coroutine sends the second task to the channel, and uh, at first, the first consumer is busy processing the first task, so there is no other receive call, and uh, because of that, the producer coroutine gets suspended. There is no second receive call from this channel. R send, now send calls, suspends the producer coroutine. Now let's imagine the second consumer comes, starts, and it's ready to receive element from this channel. Then this moment of rendezvous happens, and the second task is passed to the second channel, send and receive calls meet in time, and the second coroutine, the second consumer, is busy, gets busy processing the second task. So they just start processing them. In, our, in my simple case, I just had two task, tasks, but in general case, of course, consumer can just send tasks uh, whenever they appear, and uh, the consumer, so producers and the consumers are ready to receive tasks. And in this case, we can, uh, so in this case, we can just send th the specific number of tasks, or in general case, you can just send new tasks to the channel 
whenever they appear in producer you can you, you don't even need to clo close it so you can send uh, whenever something comes and the consumer the code for consumers uh, is a bit different now you can now iterate over uh, all over the channel and this iteration this iterating of the channel under the hood calls receive method while iterating and what it will do it it will suspend if nothing is yet available in the channel and if something is available it will receive it and process it so that how this producer consumer solution works for many tasks and uh, it is a general primitive how to communicate how to share something tasks data between different coroutines and you see that it uh, automatically balances the load so whenever there, uh, there is no available produ consumers the producer will just suspend so if you have fixed number of producers and fixed number of consumers this suspension mechanism will automatically balance the load of this channel of your of your system of your application the buffer channel uh, works very similarly to how rendezvous channel works with the difference that it also has the buffer uh, so you can store some so th this channel will be able to store some elements inside but the general idea that uh, the, uh, the next suspend calls uh, will suspend if the, bu the buffer is, uh, is full is the same so the, se the send calls will suspend if the buffer is already full and the receive call will suspend if the channel is empty so there is no exceptions there is no nothing uh, there is no null returned, it's just in case of there, there are no tasks, there are no producers, there are no consumers, the uh, counterpart, the second part, just suspends. So that was all what I wanted to cover today. If you want to learn more about Kotlin coroutines, you can, uh, you can check what, what, what we have. Uh, as I've, I've told you, there is uh, th there is this basic support for coroutines at the language level and everything else is implemented in the library. So we have a sync await implemented in the library, channels implemented in the library, uh, also actors, also yield as in C-sharp works under, uh, uses the underlying Im implementation of coroutines, it does use asynchronity, asynchronous programming, it has nothing to do with asynchronous programming, but under the hood it just uses the same mechanism of coroutines and much more, and lots of stuff is and can be implemented in the library. We have, If you want to play with it, we have uh, now hands-on lab, intro to coroutines and channels, that allows you to, to just play a bit without it by yourself. Also, there are talks, I would recommend the talks by Roman Elizarev, who is the main author, is main creator of the library, and he has given different talks about coroutines, different designs, and especially interesting that in these Kotlin coroutines, in practice, he, it is the moment when he says that, okay, before we didn't have structured concurrency, and now we have this structured concurrency, and he shows what was before and what's, uh, what, is, what, what comes afterward. If you want to learn more about Kotlin, I can't mention the Kotlin book, which you actually can uh, look through, uh, bro through in this conference. Uh, it's available. And uh, we recently recorded the whole course about Kotlin at Coursera. It doesn't cover coroutines yet, but it covers all the, all the rest. And the book doesn't cover coroutines yet as well, but it covers all the rest of Kotlin. So thank you a lot for, be for being here, for listening, and have a nice Scotland with coroutines. <laughs> and I'm ready to answer your questions. I'm sorry, Sibin. Uh, like, can channels uh, do, do channels automatically support data duplication? Uh, 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 I'm not sure about native support, uh, but uh, I don't know. I actually don't think I'm not sure, but I don't think they support data duplication. Uh, but uh, but probably it's already planned. I, I I don't. I'm not sure. I can answer your <laughs> question. Sorry. Yes. 
No, no, it's uh, I unless it's main UI thread, it's not possible. So if you want to thread local variables, there is some mechanism to attach it to coroutines, but uh, it's um, like, okay, uh, there is also a possibility when you have a specific thread, you create a new thread and you say, and you create your custom dispatcher that says all uh, this coroutine should be run on this thread. Yeah, in this case, it's possible. If it's uh, if you just want to if you just use the thread from the common pool, then any thread will it's it's a built-in mechanism and any thread will be used. Context of the user. What what do what do you mean available? Uh, there is just the reference that you can pass. Or what do you mean? Or it's th uh, throat and circle. So, like for example, that plugs into the reactive world, then mm -hmm. a bunch of things just disappear. And uh, that's kind of annoying. <laughs> ah, but uh, in coroutines, you can. Uh, coroutines uh, wrap their. Like you, you, mm, uh, when you start a coroutine, it automatically has access to all the, uh, everything inside the scope, so you can explicitly pass something to, to, something to it. So it's not that uh, it's uh, like uh, because they're like uh, under the hood, there are lambdas that can capture their uh, the scope. Then you can automatically capture their capture their whole coroutines. By the way, I think I forgot to mention it. Different libraries, including Spring, in the view uh, is going to already have or are going to publish their native support for this stuff for coroutines and suspend functions. So I suppose that uh, they will uh, they will provide kind of expected way. Uh, Spectre's guidelines how to work with uh, with, uh, with all this. Yes. Uh, start to 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 how the coroutines uh, compare it with the deferred. Yeah, uh, performance wise. Uh, with the what? With the uh, because in in Kotlin case deferred is task. Yeah. Yeah. So no no. Uh, I mean the coroutine. Uh, Coroutines also uses uh, the concepts of deferred. So deferred objects t uh, is actually a reference, kind of a reference to, to running coroutines. So uh, we uh, we also, I mean, what what is the comparison wh when we compare coroutines object uh, to how it's implemented? I uh, can't say for sure. There is this uh, some small overhead that you will need to or to to ha to stroll all the state of. The coroutine. So, for instance, here when you suspend the coroutine, you you store all the call stack. Uh, so there is small overhead uh, for this, but on the other hand, it's only one object, and uh, there are no um, like in if we compare, for instance, with the uh, callbacks and re with reactive approach, then in callbacks and re reactive approach there will be several lambdas, but here only one object. I don't. Uh, uh, I don't. I can't give you an answer how it's compared to, like, what is exact overhead in comparison to 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 to, to one call. Like here, if we store default, there is won't be this the whole call stack. I ca uh, I don't know any benchmarks, but uh, as what I've already heard, it works quite well in terms of performance. So I just can give a very generic answer. Yes. Uh, <coughs> yes. Yeah, so when we uh, with this channels mm -hmm. we wait for send or for receive something. Can we uh, control somehow, some put some restrictions on these uh, weights? So for example, put some timeout that I would like to wait for some message, but if no message comes in a minute, I want to go on. Uh, um, I'm not sure. I think, uh, uh, where is it? The easiest way would be to just look at the channel implementation. Uh, I'm not sure myself uh, whether it's already available or it's planned to be added. Uh, probably I can check. Just a second. Uh, any more questions? Oh, so I will answer you. Just c come to me in a minute. Yes. Is there a reactive option uh, like Kotlin? Uh, you can use uh, Kotlin. Is when we are talking about Kotlin for JVM, you can easily use reactive streams or Re Rx Java. Yeah. It just works. There, it it has some a little bit of additional extensions like Rx Kotlin, but uh, it calls Rx Kotlin, but I in fact it's just a, b a bunch of additional extensions, yes. Does it use uh, uh, so, so, sorry, say it again? Does it use native Kotlin channel extensions for 
Ah, no, 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 no. This uh, this Rx Java just is uh, the library available for Java. You can't mix uh, Kotlin like Kotlin coroutines work and Kotlin s suspend functions works only with Kotlin. So it, you can't uh, if you try to call uh, you can't call suspend functions from Java, and it just works f for Kotlin without coroutines. So the uh, Rx Java is like an independent thing, and in the future we'll have uh, we'll soon be relieve, uh, release some also class um, uh, that is similar to reactive stream, but th 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 that allows the conversion. So they ca kind of can uh, be used together. But reactive stream is an independent th uh, thing that already works with Kotlin without uh, any support for coroutines. So you can just use both or decide whether you want for some specific use case. Yes. Runs out of memory. Yeah, but, uh, but it can crash the whole thing, or, or is that uh, automatically handled somehow? Uh, you mean like checking the, uh, catching the case? I don't know. This uh, should be checked. So, but uh, but I uh, my guess is just c c c like crashing out of memory. Yeah, but because uh, there is, I don't think there is a mechanism that uh, that calculates. But I haven't heard of reports like we created too many coroutines. In comparison to th to th like uh, basically the coroutines are rather cheap, especially in comparison with threads. So there is no problem of creating a lot of them. Uh, and uh, I think we'll st we still are in a, like we the whole still are in the phase when uh, like mm, like now uh, I think at last Google AO Google announced that uh, they want first class support for suspend functions for coroutines. And uh, uh, then uh, all these benchmarks of what can go wrong in case of too, too deep stack and so on, I, I suppose will follow. I haven't read any guidelines in, in, ga in the sense that don't, uh, do don't create too deep coroutines. So far, it seems like every. Uh yeah, you have. Um, uh, you. Uh, like you mean uh, wh whether you want to 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 observe it somehow? No, no, just uh, launching the coroutine. Is it gonna capture everything that's in this class? So I'm keeping reference of the community. Oh no no no! You you it's uh, no. There is, uh, like it just captures the I suppose the reference of uh, to, to 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 the class itself, unless you, uh, like and. Just, um, but I'm not sure it if it captures unless you're using it. So uh, that's uh, that also have to be checked. Like we we, we can we can check it if you want to. Wha like I what I'm saying like uh, whether it captures uh, anything that uh, that it doesn't use. So usually how capturing uh, local variables works. If it, if you use these local variables, it's captured. If you don't use it, uh, that's uh, you don't need it. Yeah. So for coroutines, it should work similarly. Uh, I'm not sure about this reference, but I. S my guess it should be like this, so it won't capture unless you use it. Yeah, but uh, there is uh, there is some work in progress in terms of providing the convenient way to debug everything and to observe what happens under the hood. So recently they added the support for uh, like in the when you debug, you can see uh, the stack trace of uh, of uh, the protein at the moment of suspension, and there are other. Uh, Things probably already added, or uh, like the the, uh, the the way to uh, to to see what is the current state, like what 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 routines we have currently, they currently run, they're currently suspended, and so on. So it's also possible. So I think uh, probably something else going on here. I'm I'm still here, so if you want, uh, we can, uh, and I'll be able at the booth, I suppose, during the day. <coughs> uh, and I have huge Kotlin stickers. <laughs> So if you're interested, but they will, oh, again will be at the booth, I think.